steel turbine. You're watching the metal voice. Look who we have here. We got the man from the big four, Dave Ellison from Megadeth, and Jeff Young of Megadeth and Kings of Thrash, now Kings of Thrash. And also Deep, right? Diet, yeah. Diet. Yeah. I'm blurring my English still. Unless you're German. And it would be Deep. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Maybe right. We're hanging out the I German. before E, the E before I, right? Right on. Yeah. Which, by the way, I keep seeing you are a member of the Big Four. Yeah. You are a recorded member of Anthrax. Well, yeah, that's true. Or one of the Big Four. I played with them. Don't ever forget them. Thank you. <laughs> Again. And I played with Jeff before. Oh, so is Jeff. He's one of the Big Four. He played with uh, the Randy Rhodes Remembrance. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So, funny thing with that. So, Jeff and I, we've stayed in touch. In fact, we actually ended up on stage at our uh, Ronnie Montrose Remembrance show. <laughs> like, I don't know, the five, six. first year of it. Was it? Yeah. Years ago. Yep. Seven, seven years ago, whatever it was. I look over, there's Jeff, and uh, we give a hug and a hi and play Bad Motor Scooter or something. But um, And then when we started doing uh, the uh, Nick Menza documentary in uh, 2022. That was one of my questions. Yeah, yeah. We started that in January, and, and Jeff uh, kindly put together the facility for us, the one of his friends, for us to do most all of the interviews. And then uh, we went to dinner at the Rainbow one night, and he starts humming a riff from 1988. That uh, we, you know, was kind of in the mix for the next album, wow. uh, and I was like, dude, I totally remember that riff, and because uh, it had this kind of, it's in seven or something, right? It's like an odd time thing. So um, I'm lucky was, I remembered that riff. <laughs> I know you did. He sang it to me, literally, dude. Remember this riff? No, I'm gonna get down, I'm gonna get down. I went, ah, I totally remember that riff. So uh, we th that became a song called uh, "Bridges Burned," oh, cool. that we actually played on uh, Kings of Thrash tour a little bit a year ago. But um, yeah, and then like, I don't know, two months, so we went in the studio actually with Mike Keller who uh, plays drums in the Lucid, the sure. Raven and everything. And um, Jeff and I just threw out four songs in a couple of days. I mean, it just, they just fell out, you know? And, um, and that started really co us connecting about some new music. And then he, Jeff he hit me, he goes, dude, they're doing a tribute to the big four at, at the Whiskey, at the Ultimate Jam, you want to come out? So I did and we jumped up and I said, only if we can play Mary Jane, because like, you know, that's kind of this deep cut. And I know the fans have been craving these deep cuts. So we did. We did Mary Jane. Yeah, we did Mary Jane. Mary Jane, In My Darkest Hour, which is a crowning song for Jeff, his guitar work on that song, and it was a single and everything. So uh, that, and then really right after that, like after that night, we just, wow, this is cool. Chaz Leone uh, was our singer that night. And the funny thing with Chaz is I did a book signing down at Warwick's in La Jolla. Um, and La Jolla, California, and Chaz's band, Woke Up Dead, it was a Megan mega a tribute band, was out on the sidewalk playing, and I went out and I jammed some songs with him, right? Awesome. So it's, you know, That's it's, cool that I just, you know, it's like when people say, are you going to NAM or not going to NAM or, oh, I'm not going, or it's like, man, you're missing out, man. Get in the room, be part of the action. You know, and I think that's me and Jeff's story. You know, it's like we just say yes to stuff. Here we are, Nam. We're at the whiskey. We're in a movie. Just say yes to Neil Turbin. Here we are. But uh, you ever miss you, Megan? That be Megan? Steve ever reached out? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, but as far as as far no, he has not reached out. As far as Megan, of course. I mean, look, it's my band too. I helped start it, right? So you know, it's uh, yeah. So you know. But, but let me be clear, there are things about it, of course, that I miss, the fans, the performances, the shows, and, and I li enjoy the touring. I, I like, I'm a road warrior, man. My, I'm a wanderlust guy. My, my, my fortune in life is out there, not just sitting at home. You know, I've tried that, and I, I get bored after about a month. You know, I'm a shitty, I'm a shitty golfer, and I can't surf worth a damn, so I may as well play, stay on the road and play, you know, so. But yeah, so it's so look. There's of course there's things about that, and you know the big gig and everything. But you know, Megadeth was not always a big gig. It was we started wherever everybody else starts. You know, it was small gigs. So I've known it from the bottom to the top and everything in between. And um, but you know, honestly, as the tides turn and as things go, I mean, I'm super happy and very content with with everything I'm doing now. You know, I'm, I always say I'm making music I like with people I like. To me, now at my age, at this point, I've already got the Grammy, I'm good. You know what I mean? So for me, that those are the things that are more important to me now at this point in my life, is enjoying what I do and who I do it with. You're, you know, a very active businessman for a long time. You've always, you've always been very consistent. Jeff and I were both raised, ironically, in families that had successful businesses, you know. Um, and we were raised 
in families that understood that were more sophisticated, I think, kind of financially, how to think like that. Um, and we were raised like that, you know, that... Um, it's a very valuable thing. It, it, it really is because, you know, it, it, first of all, it takes away the rebellion aspect that, you know, you have to rebel against something. And, and that, look, that makes for great rock and roll too, you know. But, you know, I think Jeff and I, we we're both guys that pursued music because it was a love, it was a passion. We love the music, we love, you know, all that goes with it. But it wasn't like we had some ax to grind against, you know, the school and the police and our mom and dad, you know, and all that. So that just, I don't know, I think it just, it makes for a, in the long game, that makes for a different outcome. In the short game, the rebellion pays off well. In the long game, I think I'm glad I, I have it the way that I've been blessed to have it. Excellent. So uh, with regards to the Dick Manson movie, is there a title for it that I'm missing? Yeah, it's called This Was My Life, The Story of Nick Mensa. And when, when do you, can we expect that might be coming out? You know, you... We're hoping for a summer release. Right now, we're, we're literally just shopping the distribution for it right now. Okay. Um, and why should people see it? You know, why be, should fans Because it's the story of Nick. And obviously, look, 10 years of that is Megadeth. That's the fireworks. That's the big attention getter. But, you know, Nick has such a great story growing up in a very musical household. His dad being a, you know, he's not known to metalheads because he's a, he's a sax player, he's a woodwind player. But in that world, he's the guy. I mean, he is the Jimi Hendrix of that world, you know. First chair with Buddy Rich, Louis Belson. He's had his own bands. Uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a fantastic musician. And... Um, and so, you know, Nick growing up in that, you know, Nick is a real character. He's a lovable, likable guy. I think when you see the movie, it feels like Nick is sitting right here in the room with you watching it. Well, I remember when we were at, uh, we did a, a trade show at a, a conference. We saw, what, it was in the Rock and Roll Autograph Show. At yeah, yeah, yeah. West in Billy X. I remember that, yeah. So, he was there, yeah. He had a table right next to one. Yeah. And then Chris Hall was, then Nick was. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's interesting you say that. So one year, to call it 20, 13. Hall, the next hall over here at NAM is the Trump Hall, right? I walk in, I see Nick. I'm like, whoa, hey, dude, what's happening? Da, da, da. It was right around this exact same time. Then I think after that, we did the autograph show. The next year, 2014, I see Nick and I'm like, listen, things have shifted inside of Megadeth. You're going to get a call. And I don't know if it's for a, a gig, play a song, but the, you're going to get a call for something. And then sure enough, later that year, he got the call. And, you know, there was this sort of attempt to try to put together this Rusty Reese lineup reunion. And it wasn't meant to be. And, and truthfully, Nick had sort of matured into a different guy. His chops and playing were very different. You know, to go out and do these big gigs on these on that level, you have to be it, you have to really train to be an athlete. And, and, it, and it hurts drummers the worst. Me and Jimmy DeGrasso had a chat about this some years back. It beats drummers up first, you know. It's very physical, it takes its toll, and you know, any drummer that can survive that for you know the decades and turn into these legacy bands is is, is a special thing, you know, because it beats them up. I don't want to leave Jeff out. Yeah, no, please, please. On what's the question? In, in terms of uh, you know, just the physical demands of, of being in Well, lately lately what I've been doing because I've been hanging out in Phoenix, I go up in the canyons. And they're not manicured like Fryman or Runyon Canyon. They're kind of rocky. That's so rocky, you got to climb or hold on. But I take my guitar and I run through the songs like in kind of slow motion as I'm hiking, which sure beats, you know, sitting in a chair 14 hours a day. Plus, then you get on a stage and it's just like skating on ice. It's just like so simple. So, what David said is, you know, so apropos. It's very much. And we're, you know, we're not in our 20s anymore, so we're, but we're still training. You're aware. You're, you're we're training like we're going to the Olympics before we go out on tour, lest we pay the price. Right? You're, you're very self-aware of the demand, so you're very, I mean, that's brilliant. He told me that, that he, one day I called him, he said, dude, I'm out hiking, playing my guitar. Are you nuts? When I moved, you know, me and Nick Menzi used to mountain bike all the time. He got me into mountain biking when I got sobered up in 1990. While we were making Rust in Peace and in between the tour legs, we'd go mountain biking up in the Hollywood Hills and um, probably those same canyons Jeff was just talking about. And and then I moved to Arizona and I go out on my one mountain bike ride and I'm like, holy shit, I got to choose between hitting the cactus or the rock 
as I'm going down, right? And I just went, fuck this, I ain't doing this anymore. So I stopped mountain biking. I, I street bike now, right? I, 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 but I don't, I don't mountain bike anymore. So when Jim told me that, I'm like, I couldn't imagine like, yeah, because you're right, slipping on the rocks, the desert rocks. I mean, you know, if you could take it, take an endo, just, just hiking, just normal, just while looking around. So he's got his guitar. So I got the good grip. Yeah. Right off. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. On the So Far So Good So What tour, we were sharing roofs, right? We double up. But Jeff and I spent a fair amount of time sharing rooms together, and it was great because it was a very musical environment, right? I learned a lot from Jeff. He showed me some of the licks and. Yeah, and especially in my darkest hour, um, and you know, and because I, I like to play guitar as well, I write better on guitar. So it's like I learned some some little tricks and some of the stuff that D obviously learned at GIT. Because I was going to go to BIT and I didn't go because I you know met Dave, but sort of like the opportunity was there to go do what I really wanted to do, which was you know let's head to the top of the hill of rock stardom, right? So that moment showed up. I grabbed it and I went, right? But. I've been a lifelong student of the guitar, learning and playing. I play a lot of piano at home. I, even if me and my cat are the only two that ever hear these songs, you know. I mean, it's like, but it's you know, it's just fun to sit down and do some things, you know, that are and not just the more of the same. You know, some days I look in, I go, I don't want to go in that room and write another song on the guitar, so I'll just go over sit down on the piano, walk around singing, you know, with the dia thing. I started singing, uh, right. yeah, and you know, the producer Christian Cole was here yesterday. And I give him total credit because I can sing and I can write lyrics and I can put it together. But you know, when you're on the mic recording, as you know, because you're a singer, to really get the character of a song and to really sell the story of what it is, right? And especially to the audience, in our case, metal, right? I can't do that on my own. I'll be the first to admit it. I need someone, at least at this phase of my singing career, I need someone to really sculpt me and really get me to let that character come out and i've done voiceover work i've done all this different stuff you know but to sing is a whole other thing so i enjoyed being trained sculpted and 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 put into a character uh which christian did i mean i give him total credit for helping me get that done well it's great i think it's great for any musician of any kind to like be like in, in basketball with Michael Jordan, or it's like an MVP. We could take play all the positions. Right. Like if you have a cup of work at all the positions, you know those positions. Hey, I learned that from Harley Peavy when I did artist relations for Peavy here. Harley had done everything in that company. He hand wired the first amp. He took it out to sell it. So he was the engineer, the builder, the salesman. He took the money. Now he's the accountant. Went back, built two of them, sold those two built four of them, sold those four, and that's how we built the company. There's a lot to be said for that, yep. and it's something that, in case someone doesn't show up for work that day, yep. you're short-handed, I mean, it's good to have those. Well, one day we were at a trade show in New York, it was a small little thing, and he was helping put cabinets away into boxes and stuff, he was just helping us out, he probably felt bad for us, right? And, and you know, and it really, you know, I was, we were talking about a box one day, so this box sucks, you open it, you pull it out, it's trash, you can't restock. And that really got him. He said, we need to fix that, you know? And I thought about that because my whole life has been owning rock bands, right? Since I was 12 years old, I've owned rock bands, right? And it's the same thing, you know? Unless you've wound the cables and you've duct taped shit down and you've been the guy adjusting the thing and hooking it up and running the soundboard and making sure the light, you know? Unless you've done all of that from top to bottom, you really don't know your stage. You don't know your band. You don't know, like Jeff said, learn how to skate on ice on stage. Like it needs to be that easy and that. I, I heard a great thing. When I when I memorize it, it's in my head. But when I know it from heart, then I don't even have to think about it anymore because it's in my heart, right? So really know it by heart, you know? That's a very valuable piece of information. Knowing the songs, like half-assed knowing something versus it's, you know, like the Bible. And you're, yeah, yeah. Like, you know the word. Right. Yeah, exactly. you, could, you could quote scripture. It's like, you know, my theology right here, yeah. And when it's music, that yeah, you yeah. do that. So there's one question I have, and I, don't, I want to respect your time, because I know you have yeah, to answer. Yeah, we go, yeah. But I wanted to ask you, because I, I was here for your seminar, and also you had the doctor here. You listen to what he, he had to say, and also what you had to say about the bass, and the way you're holding the guitar, about your wrist and everything, the position. Yeah. And of course, I was thinking about the Ramones when, you know, you're talking about, oh, they're really low. Yeah, yeah. And I always, you know, have guys that are jazz players or, or MI players, and they're holding it so high, like, 
see these guys that play bass that's like all the way up from their neck like a bow tie yeah but, but i was i was noticing that you know one of the things that you you, you talked about is that you play with a dick and i really respect that because i'm a huge Phil Lyneth man, and yeah, yeah. Lizzie, and, uh, you know, like Phil always has this the sound that's like a live and dangerous. It's just right there in the in the right you know, place. You know what I realized about that. So you know, one year we had a metal Legion tour. We booked it. It was right after the New Year, which is like it's the worst time to book a tour, right? But we we had these four shows, and one of them was going to be at the Whiskey. Lo and behold, right after Christmas, Lemmy dies. So they asked us at the Whiskey if we would be the house band for the Lemmy tribute. They did the funeral his day at Forest Lawn. That night, they shut down the Sunset Strip. Metal Legions became the house band. We had everybody coming up on stage playing Motorhead songs. So I really had to deep dive some Motorhead stuff. You know what hit me about Lemmy is his, his strumming. He plays the bass like an acoustic guitar. You know, like, like it's like... Right, and I, I was a worship leader in church for a few years, right? So I really learned, I studied a lot of these big Christian artists that really know how to lead. Because I would try to lead from a bass position, it was harder, like the sting thing, versus grabbing a guitar, I could be more musical, I could sing better. And well, then moving into Lemmy world, I realized, it's like this kind of kumbaya strumming by the campfire and when it when i when it hit me i'm like this done i totally got lemmy's whole thing right that that's what it is and, and that's so cool that you that's why that. he plays kind of one five power chords and, and the guitar is a secondary kind of thing on that in that band right it's a lead guitar it's there but it's like it's like john lord in deep purple we all thought it was richie blackmore played the heavy shit it's john lord na na ga 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 na right his his sound of that keyboard defined the sound of Deep Purple. Same way Lemmy's bass playing like this kind of acoustic strumming because he's, you know, singing and playing is this deal. Phil and Ott's the same thing. Paul McCartney, as we now know, is was really a guitar player. And they, I think, flipped the coin and he got the bass duties. Some would say the shortest straw. I'd say he won big, but, you know. So, you know, people go, oh, my God, his bass playing. It is. But he's really a guitar player, so he's thinking more melodically, like a like a guitar player, and he's thinking more. His bass lines are more like a vocalist. He's he's writing vocal parts, like think like silly love songs. Amazing! It's like one of the best bass lines ever written. I always love that song. And they use counterpoint. Yeah. In their playing, yeah, when, when you're doing that, that's what he's in, intimating is yeah. counterpoint, which is like finger style and flamenco players, because you got your thumb to play the bass line and you got your fingers to play the melodies. So you're playing counterpoint, but in Western music and pop, there's not a lot of counterpoint in guitar play. It's a lot of strumming or chunking, right? So you miss that counterpoint thing, unless you're more of a finger style player, which is a really, it's a good point. And Lemmy was really into rockabilly and, he was. and that whole thing. And, you know, Gene Simmons is a guitar player, right? Gene, Gene's a guitar player and a songwriter. So he sings, that's why his bass lines are very, you know, they're McCartney's. But they're always moving around, you know, like, you know, the cold gin, firehouse, all this stuff that he's doing, you know, he's moving around. And and um, so to me, these these pick players, it, who cares if it's with fingers or pick or your toes or your teeth? Who gives a shit how you play the thing, right? It doesn't matter. Who cares? Because you're, you're conveying the song. You're, it's the message, right? It's the, it's the, you know, we have two questions, you know, really like, one, what is the song about? Like, we're writing some stuff together, right? We're working, you know, behind the scenes on some stuff. And it's always about, you know, you write a lyric. And I have to ask myself, what's it, what's it about? One question, what's it about? And can you answer it in an interview in like a sentence or two? Ah, oh, it's about this guy and then this girl. And they, or they, they, they went out and they, you know, polit political retort, whatever it is your, your thing is, right? So, you know, it's, it's always about just a simple question. What's the song about, right? And um, so for me, it, I, I'm way less about all the noodly shit. It's just about, can you, does it make sense? Does anybody like it? I like that line of the, in Purple Rain, you know, and the guy, the club owner's like, Prince, you're the, you're, you're all, your music only makes sense to you, or you're the only one who understands your, your music. Meaning, no matter how great it is, if no one can relate to it or understand it, it's... It's basically a bedroom solo project, you know what I mean? It's all it really is. Even if you're Prince, you know, at some point you got to open it up to the point that, you know, I, you know, when you're performing, look, 
it's real clear. When you perform, are you pushing people? Are you making people leave the room or come into the room? Like that's all that matters, you know. When we the other night we did a show at the Metal Hall of Fame, when we got on stage, everybody came to the front. Enough said. That's what's important. that's all that matters, really, right there. Because you know, when you're on stage, you're in the service industry. You're like a waiter. Hey, here's some songs to the people. It ain't about you. It's about them. You know. So be of service. Entertain your customers. Entertain your fans. Right. You got to do what's right for that that moment. Totally. Yeah. Bring it in. Yeah. So people ask, well, do you have any advice? It's like, yeah. Are you bringing people in or are you pushing them away? It's there. It's pretty simple, right? So I, I want to be respectful of your time and yeah. also the. I, I don't want to forget the most, one of the most important things, elephants and coffee, because that's why we have this on the wall. Right yeah, now. yeah, so, yeah. So tell us about that real quick and uh, what, what kind of coffee should we be trying? Up what? That one right over there. <laughs> no, you know, look, we've got all the... Yeah, we got, you know, the roasted pieces are... I, I kind of did... I, I like... Look, it's a Starbucks model, right? It's a light, medium, dark, right? So I like it, because for me in the morning, I like to have a kind of... A lighter because it because the caffeine's stronger. In the afternoon, when I have a cup, I'll have a darker roast because it has less caffeine and it's richer and it's dark, right? So I kind of go through the spectrum. That's just me personally. So we got a bunch of sale here. You can get it online. Ellisonemporium.com is where all the stuff is: shirts and bases and coffee and whatever else do I need. Well, it sounds great, Dave. Yep. I just want to say thank you for the fantastic interview, you and Jeff. Yeah, and I wish you. You know, much success with your, with Kings of Thrash, with Dyth, did I say it right? Pretty close, Dyth, brother. Think Kings English, Dyth. Dyth. You know, and, and also here in Nav, you know, I yeah, mean, yeah. obviously you got a lot of folks here waiting for you, so yeah, I yeah. you uh, get back to that. Man. Get back to Thanks work. so much, and uh, see you, a quick uh, ID from the Metal Boys. Sure, man. Yep. We do it together. I started to just go to TP. Hello, folks, ladies and germs. This is Jeff Young from Kings of Thrash, and... Hi, David Ellison. You are hanging here with us on Metal Voice.